Hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. One of the favorite PMs of the week, as usual. Get to the end of the week, we relax, get a good guest, sit down, get an in-depth conversation on what it is that makes them. But I'm sure for those of you on social media, this pulpit is not news to you. Suddenly they burst onto the scene, preaching reality. That's right. Alabasta International Ministry. And some of the things you may say is controversial, but it's real and it's true. And since we are in a real world and a true world, sometimes we hunger and thirst for those messages. And so onto the scene comes Prophet Dr. Kofi Odro. And I'm here to find out why he has deviated from the status quo, all the magic and all the spirits and witches, and preaching and telling wives to be active, be positive in their marriages, and that's why I'm here. Now, I think he has a very interesting, interesting story. An interesting background from grace to grass to grace to grass. What is it that keeps him going up anytime he falls or anytime there's a challenge? You know, you say we see all their glory, but we don't know their story, and that's why I'm here. Folks, when I come back, I'm talking to Prophet Dr. Kofi Odru, now famous reality pastor, if I may call it. Don't go away. Well, 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 hello, and thank you very much for staying, and, you know, for one reason or the other, as soon as I mentioned to you know, all my close relations and friends are, look, this is the man I'm interviewing. Everybody gets curious. Everyone wants to know who's behind Alabaster Ministry and what Prophet Kofi Odro is made of. Well, we had to find out. This is one of those curious interviews myself. Yes, our path may have crossed some time ago, but it just crossed. But as to who he is, you know what, I'm yet to find, and I'm just as curious as you are. So I'll start by saying thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm so honored. Uh, so it is a blessing. <laughs> so the feeling is mutual. The, the feeling is mutual. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I want to go all the way back to, you know, when you were growing up. So at least we get to understand you. But before, you know. Everybody's asking me, what's Alabasta? I say, when I get there, I'll find out. <laughs> when I get there, I'll find out. So what, what, what's Alabasta? Alabasta is a perfume container. In ah. the ancient days, they used it to um, the apothecariatic companies that, you know, put together the, out of apothecary, um, the perfumers. Okay. They had a, a special, it was like some fiberglass or, you know, something like the P.O.P. material, uh -huh, uh -huh. where they kept perfumes in it. If it went to the ground, it had to hit the ground very hard before it breaks. Okay. Uh, and so it was a special material for perfumes. The Bible said in Matthew, uh, the 26th chapter, that Mary came with one full of perfume ointment of spiked night, very precious uh, in value, and broke it at the feet of Jesus and worshipped him. And oh. so uh, the whole concept of alabaster is having uh, the glory of God in an earthen vessel. So we are the container carrying God's glory, basically. There you, there, there you go. <laughs> I, I know too now. <laughs> Also, when I know you, uh, Tesano boy. That's right. If, 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 if I can dare say that. <laughs> I know you were a Tesano boy. So what was growing up in Tesano like? Interesting. And, um, growing up in Tesano was, you know, very interesting. There was a switch that came in that made it um, a little bizarre. Mm -hmm. I was born here in Tesano. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up with, any of the big names, you know, from Ufuri Penny Fear, because most of the gates, the Amuakwatas, the Ufuriatas, they all were born here. Okay. You know, um, Mr. Kosia Amuakwata, whose house is not too far from here. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. William Ufuriata, the politician, mm -hmm. whose house is not far from here. Mm -hmm. 
um, the great politician called where they say whose house is not far from here. Could you you know, so the list goes on. Mm. You know, Tesano was like the East Ligon of yesterday. Yeah. <coughs> or the Laboni of yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was uh, a prestigious uh, place. We were born here. My father uh, had the privilege. Um, I was born next to Abeka Presbyterian Church, a historic building in there. Uh, the old man was just about, I'd gone on pension. I'm the last born to 11 children. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'd gone on pension, so we had to, uh, he had started his company, he was, you know, doing very well. And then suddenly, um, most of the contracts folded up. So we had to move house from Abeka to, from Tesano to Abeka, between Abeka and Fadama. You know, so in my teenage, well, that's yeah, a big, that's a big move. That was a short big, distance, but big. That move. was a drastic move. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time in my life, I saw a pit latrine. Wow! First time in my life, I'd never seen one. I mean, we went to school. They talk about you know KVIP. Yeah, it yeah. was just book. I saw it in a book. I never saw yeah. one. Wow! But I had to see one and use one for a long time. Wow! Yeah, so. It was a swish, and then the swish will have to take us into Abeka. Then you know how, life. How did you adjust to the switch? Honestly speaking, for the first year, it was like I was dazed because wow. we had to change schools and everything. You know, we moved from I, I was attending parents' experimental preparatory school, not too far from Saint Teresa School. We changed school. You know, the people that we used to go to school with. Uh, most of them went to Anne's Preparatory Center Reasons. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, didn't see us again. <laughs> and that was the switch. It was a huge switch. Switch of friends and everything and everything. See, that's where I got introduced to gangs. Because I was just moving from nine years to ten years. That is what I call my teenage years mm -hmm. because... You know, it was so drift, it was so swift, it was so drastic, you know, we had to go into. And then we switched schools. Now my school was Tesano Primary School. So I went for the first time to a government school. Wow. And then, you know, uh, now I had to be dealing with gangs who will send you to buy them weed, you know. Then I was introduced to ghetto life and all that. Um, my mother trained us um, in the Presbyterian circles, mm -hmm. um, the Presbyterian church. Most of the things that I know now, the, you know, was inculcated into me by the Presbyterian church. Uh, so anytime you mention the Presbyterian church, uh, for me, it's like give back time for me. Um, uh, but when the switch came, mm -hmm. I had just finished my confirmation. And, um, you know, just drift of back later into the world. Church was not a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, when you are an around boy for a weed smoker, mm -hmm. definitely you will come to that place. Mm -hmm. You know, so we joined gangs. Um, and uh, interesting lessons that we learned from the gangs, mm -hmm. you know, which today I comparatively look at the church. Mm -hmm. And it's not like that. If a gang, in our gangs, if we don't like you, we don't like you. We don't hide it. We don't cross carpets. We don't come to you. We don't pretend. You know, we don't like you. If we meet you, you are an enemy. We fight you, and that's it. In the church I came, if they don't like you, it's the opposite. They still smile at you. <laughs> they still smile they, at you. They smile, they pretend, they, you are like their friend in disguise, and then they stab you. It's very interesting. <laughs> you know, so we grew up, um, that's why we knew how to fight, how to, you know. I think that uh, part of how aggressive I am came from the ghettos, oh. you know. It was a fearless environment, you know. Nobody feared anybody. Um, the, the, the ghettos of Fadama didn't fear the police. They didn't fear the courts. They didn't fear oh. blood. Blood was normal. I mean, there was nothing that could put fear. Fear was not a thing, oh. you know. Could fight anybody, you know, that kind of life. Uh, until um, 
all this I was going to school. Um, I'm the grandson of the father of anesthetists uh, in Africa, Professor Kofi Amodro. So apparently I am not a Friday born, but because I was named after him, okay. um, you know, I'm talking about Professor Kofi Amodro of Kukren Tome. Um, my, during my birth, there was something that, uh, you know, happened. Uh, Professor Ampofo of Kolebu and uh, my grandfather, uh, because doctors were on strike and, uh, you know, there was no way that my mother could be delivered in a hospital. And so they took my mother into a home, uh, their home, and delivered her. Uh, so I was named after Professor Kofi Amwa Utru Osei. Even though Osei is my father's name, I was named after him. So mm -hmm. I took his three names, Kofi Amwodro. Wow. So my name is Kofi Amwodro Osei. Yeah. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. But you, you, you are the last of 11. The, Correct. The, your 10 elder siblings, uh, when you moved, how were they also adjusting and what happened to them? It's very interesting. And uh, when we moved, before we could move, uh, most of them had uh, finished um, sixth form. Uh, some of them were entering into university. Uh, some of them had left home because, uh, you know, now we've, I think we've lost two. Yeah, two of them passed on. Um, my mother's side has five. I'm the last of the five. Mm -hmm. My father's side has six other, and then my mother's side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, makes it 11. Mm -hmm. But um, it was very intriguing for them. My mother did, my father did not marry at a time, you know, divorce after one and then another and then another. And so my brothers and sisters, those that had left for the university had left. And then those who were with us, you know, lived with us. I mean, we left a house where we had many bedrooms, big, you know, reception rooms and everything to now a one little reception room and then two bedrooms. So in the bedroom that I slept, almost like 14 or 13 people could sleep in the same room. It was very interesting. Wow. It was very interesting. How, how, you know. how reassuring was mom there? Because moms are always quite strong, you know, and pretend everything is okay. I mean, how was mom dealing with it? My mother is a praying woman, even till today. Mm -hmm. um, in all my rough life, my mother was praying. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that during my confirmation, the scripture, you know, everybody receives on your certificates a particular text of the scriptures. And uh, my scripture was, Did <laughs> <laughs> think I remember, <laughs> I remember it was in the tenor of um, Reverend Daniel Okain mm -hmm. Um he said to the catechist, who I served many years after, you know, uh, domestically I washed, I ironed, I did the runs for him and all that. The catechist said, yes, unto me, the Lord keep the, both of them, may their souls rest in peace. Um, the, the Reverend Minister told the catechist, you know, it's a scripture, if you could fear, it's because when they mentioned the scripture in the church that day, the whole church was like, yeah, this guy deserves the scripture. <laughs> <laughs> so in all those crazy moments, my mom will cry. She's praying through the crying and, you know, lamentation. Father, save my boy and all that kind of Even till today, my mother is a praying woman. Mm -hmm. But I think that she uh, went through those periods with prayer mm -hmm. and intercession and with faith. Um, my father, I would not say, was too much into this Christian thing mm -hmm. because my father many years ago introduced us to Ekanka, introduced us to yoga. We went through Sai Baba a little before he became a Christian. Okay. You know, so... You're searching. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know, exploring. And then um, through it all, um, I think that the Lord saved me by my mother's prayers among a few intercessors who also um, were praying because... Had it not been for my mother's intercession, possibly I would not be alive because most of my friends died in prison. Wow. Yeah, most of my friends 
died in prison. Most of the guys who now we used to um, sell, you know, drugs and we were here at Abeka, most of them are dead, mm -hmm. including my own brother who was part of the 18 boys, you know, they were the big men, we were the run boys, you know, and um, I can tell you that most of the secular musicians, I know some of them have passed on and all, they, they all used to come, you know, to the 18, we, there is a park not too far from here, we call, we used to call it Asanka Park, a church bought it, so <laughs> they turned it into a church. You know, but those days Asanka Park was like the core, the hardened core of Abeka and Fadama. If you really, I mean, if somebody stole from you, let's say they stole your briefcase, don't even bother to go to the police station, just come to Asanka Park. We can that. get you your briefcase. Wow. Everybody that was a thief then was within our jurisdiction. Wow. I mean, the, the, we call them the 18 boys. The 18 boys will find you your briefcase without even, number of the BNA operation, without even saying that. We find our briefcase, you know, it was just <laughs> as simple as that. Wow. Yeah. So that was the life. And mm. my mother prayed every day, cried oh, every day. God bless her. You know, um, because my mother knew there was something in me. Even also my father knew because through the paths we went, um, they were trying to tell my father that this is, you know, one of the great people, you know, this generation will have. Even through the cyber bank and camp thing, they could make some predictions, you know. So he believed something that, you know, that there was something going to come out of this. Well, I, I dare say ATTC wouldn't help them because back then ATTC <laughs> was not for the faint. It wasn't for the faint-hearted. I mean, there was a guy called Submarine. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know if it was your era, but there was a guy there called Submarine or something. A really tall guy. And, I mean, in Tako, he used to intimidate the, the whole stadium. <laughs> Share your experiences at ATTC. ATTC was one of the. I remember, first year was first year was before you know the swishing, you know. So second year, um, the the whole school. I mean, when I, I I came out and said I am born again, the entire school. Uh -uh. It's not possible. I can't. This guy is just one of the strict. My principal, I remember, Mr. Buddha Smith was tired of me. When you mentioned Intaco, I mean Intaco was the thing. There was no school that didn't know me. I mean if you mention King Shaka Zulu, it's me. If you mention KD Booster, it's me. If you want my first year, I remember my first year when I went to, you know, um, I heard there was somebody who was the king that dawn. I said, I want to see this person. The moment I saw this person, I said, whoa, come to the 18 yard as Asenka Park. You are nothing. We fight everybody. The other guy wanted to like, I will make you small. I said, I want witnesses, 2 p.m. Let's go to the park. The moment the guy saw my courage and aggression, my, you know, belligerence, he, he, he came later after class and said, Unia, hey, <laughs> Meanwhile, within me, I knew Akwaimin Timino. But maybe born into the heart, said, Efa, Afa, Amfa, you know, and me, I will have to back up. But when he saw my uh, aggression, the guy, like, oh, this guy, the way all Kassan in the Utimo said, from. <laughs> so he was like, when I'm then talking to him, I'm saying, yeah, you are my friend. So we became friends. He was in his final year. So I found myself in the latter part of first year. All my friends were final year students. Okay, so when I got to the hostel, you know, I had the opportunity to sleep in, in prefix cubicles and all that kind. But I was in first year. Wow. <laughs> wow. 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 I remember one time I... My principal and uh, my head of department invited my, my mother to, he said, we wanted to see your parents. I knew that if my mother had come to the school and heard all the stuff about me, she would collapse. I knew if my father had come, she, he would disown me. So I brought my sister, 
who had a restaurant not too far from the school. And then when they gave my bio and my memoir to my sister, up till today, he didn't tell my parents what it was. I mean, in ATTC, if a fight breaks up, you will be, you know, uh, expedited out of the school. You will be expelled straight because they believed, because we were technicians, everybody's tool was a weapon. Yeah. So fighting in the school was out of the picture. So if the fight is aggressive, you go to Nima Police Station, which was not too far from the school. Mm -hmm. If you steal Nima Police Station, so why so many people go into Nima Police Station? The police who used to come for the guys, you know what I'm saying? And that more bad try, you know. I bet yes, a fun. And so most of the fights, I mean, Ubiju had the other catch them. It was that kind of thing. But in my final year, I had that, that was where the turning point came. One day I was sleeping in my room and then I had you know, an agitation within myself. So I decided to go to the school field. Everybody knows the school field is just behind the school. Went to the school field just to get some fresh air out of the agitation. Right after the, I passed out without knowing. Apparently, I didn't know that that was what they, the, the Christians used to call falling under the anointing. Because I, I didn't know. That was my first experience. When I woke up, people had surrounded me. It was like, I 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 knew that I had not smoked. And then I began to narrate the experience to these guys, you know, that I've seen angels, a host of angels, singing to a king. Apparently, for the first two weeks, they thought I was going mad. Because a week after I started preaching in the school, dawn broadcast. And then a week after then I went out, you know, on the streets of, you know, early in the morning and started preaching. So they thought that, you know, this guy is mad. So if, let me take a break here and come because <laughs> this is getting exciting. You see, I told you that there is something behind this passion. We're coming straight back. Well, thank you very much for staying, but this is a story and a half. <laughs> so, uh, my, my challenge now is how do people, you know, see the, you know, merge the two sides of you? <laughs> so, you're out there preaching. I was out there, I go from street to street and all that. At the time, um, women were being introduced to our core subjects. Uh, and our courses were technical courses, you know, masonry, carpentry, electrical work, plumbing, uh, auto engineering, and those kind of courses. It was strictly a boys program, or a men's and masculine program. And then they started introducing women to our program. So the few women that had come, we could, just a handful of women, you know. And all those women belonged to the scripture union. So I went to the scripture union because I am a born again Christian. You know, after school we went to the scripture union. And I say this to honor the scripture union and for the great work they are doing. Unfortunately, for my school, the scripture, me, when I was there, I was a hard, hard, hardcore sinner. So the moment I, I came into Christ, and even though all these guys, when I went there, they were afraid of me because they couldn't believe the this, this guy is, is in this <laughs> service. So when I go, I sit at the back and I watch them. If they finish, I close and I go home to my uh, hostel. It's, with the moment I declared that I was born, I lost all my friends in the school. I lost all my friends in the 18 yard. Wow. They thought like, oh, she made Baba. Ibaba, you know, let's leave him. And uh, so I decided not to come home. Vacations, I don't want to come home. I wanted to stay, you know, just to 
um, you know, fortunately, there was a, there is still a church within the Kokomlimle area by the name Glory Chapel. Uh, the pastor, Pastor Charles, you know, who works with uh, Charlie Bookshop as one of their managers. Yeah. So I went there to submit to him and uh, because I really needed to grow in mm. the, my newfound faith. And uh, because he was a very busy man, he used to give me the opportunity when he doesn't have the chance to go and pastor the church, he will have to send me there. At the time, I was just moving from 16 and a half years to 17 years, wow. so I had the privilege to be pastoring the church, you know, just at that age. So I go to the scripture union and these guys, I realized that a few girls that had come to the scripture union, these boys were, you know, making advances on them. I told them, hey, I am not new here. I am not old here and I, don't, I haven't found my feet here. But I will not allow you to interrupt and destroy the name of the Lord. Meno, me preacher, me nye sofo, but, me mamu mwe jamai. Me mamu wone. Adia nwa mi honu wa abon tene no. Ni enami yu su anami yu wumu no. Se mu di biba scripture union ha. Mompe. They thought I was joking. Because you were literally running away oh, from yeah, it. Yeah, I'm running away from something and these guys are, Bringing. you know, few girls are coming to church and you want to make advances on, hey, we ain't going with that. So what I, I did two weeks after, I realized that they had not heeded to my um, uh, warning. So whilst I was going to the thing, I carried a weapon, a knife. I went into the scripture union and said, from today, I don't care about your leadership and whatever, whatever that is here. I have dissolved the scripture. You know. I will start what I call a Christian fellowship. Wow, peno, baby. And pray him. Mom, man, I'm trying to me here will be our. Just what such a watching. Now they knew me, so they will heed to what I'm saying because. Because from when I quoted the scripture that Jesus put a whip in the temple of Jerusalem. And I say this to honor scripture union because some people wanted to bring your standards down and I wouldn't take it. So... The next day, I told the guys, my, I had many guys, even though my, my sacra, but me were guys, I'm a commander. Because uh, lock the doors. No scripture, you know. Let's change the days. Day no the bani answer. Now, in fact, Christian fellowship go shed the next day. To my surprise, who went to the Christian fellowship? But many people have turned up. Apparently, these guys were blocking people from coming to serve God. I was shocked. I was in my final year then, so I had to, you know, lead that group. It was my first leadership assignment for, you know, and in the afternoons. I could even bring people from outside to preach, which was not done, you know, because the people saw now, I, my, my audience were hardcore people, these smokers who had converted, uh, you know, thieves. These are my people, you know. So when I see this, um, Hip life guys, and all. I said, These are my people. <laughs> <laughs> These are my see, that is why I can take my crusade to the ghettos in Circle, ghettos in Santana, you know, the where they sell uh, Gotta Cassian and all that. These are my people, you know. I, I can smell the scent of re a mile from here. I know the smell, <laughs> I know it, you know. And so I determined that for one solid year in my final year, we had a wonderful fellowship. Wow. Real people, no pretense, no gimmicks. You know, it was a real thing. Mm -hmm. So whilst I was going to leave school, I found some few very committed Christians. We handed over the entire Christian body of uh, ATTC. We handed over to them. And then, you know, we went. But before I left, a friend of mine wanted to start a fellowship at Dansoman, so we went in to help. I was uh, with him for a year and a half, and then I came back to my roots, the Presbyterian Church. Um, Reverend Paul Ditcham 
was my pastor then. And Reverend Paul Ditcham, who used to be the Presbyterian chairman of, uh, um, you know, um, Achime Buakwa. Um, I think now they took him to Koforidia or something, um, was my pastor. He gave me the opportunity. Everything that's, you know, we see now, the origination came from him. You know, I used to go to Abeka Presby Church, that what they call the um, Victory Congregation, something I'll get there, because when we were there, they, they did not term them as congregations. Okay. You know, so um, I used to go the, to the church because my father is the same contractor that built the church. My father, his private company, built a couple of churches. You know, Niboy Town Presby, Aquitiman Presby, Abeka Presby, you know, we did a bit of the work, you know, um, at a, there's a particular laundry behind the Danceman Prison, we did that. We built a church and um, a Bible school and even, you know, uh, a contemporary school for New Life Bible Institute at McCarthy Hill. These were the, like, private projects that okay. my father did. But well, in Groma... You say we, 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 because that trained you in masonry and... That's right, that's right. Before I went to ATTC, my father had started his private company after his retirement. Okay. Myself, my biological brother, who lives now in uh, Holland, mm -hmm. um, were the few people my father trained. Okay. Yeah, so we, even though I was in school, I was still working in my father's company, you know. So I go to school and then knock off and go and work. So my jobs were on contract basis. I start like one or two and close off like seven or eight, you know, and come back to school. So while I was in school, I was earning some money because the four man of works will pay you at mm -hmm. the end of the day when your job is done. Um, so we mandated the company. Was it benefit? Has it been beneficial? Extremely, because um, I, that was the interest that took me to the technical school. I wanted, okay. my grandfather wanted me to be a medical doctor. Okay. My father said, uh -uh, our condition have changed, so we want you to go. At the time I protested, it was, you know, reluctancy, mm -hmm. you know, going to that particular school. But today, it is one of the greatest assets that the Lord has blessed us with. Wow. Because all the buildings we have, I designed it and I built it. Wow. Um, all the churches we have from Sapima to other this places, beautiful. including this, I designed to the detail interior decor. Wow. You know, because I did everything about building. I did building technology. Okay. So everything about building, from designing to draftsmanship, architecture, structural engineering, I did electrical plumbing and all that. And I specialized in carpentry and joinery, woodwork. Wow. And so, you know, every project we've ever done, including like private projects for my siblings, you know, I do. Before I call my architect, I have everything into even work drawings, dimensional, you know, then he will take it and, you know, process with the structural works and all that kind of the roof wow. plan and foundation plan and do all those things. I have lots of my friends who are pastors who through <laughs> unbelievable sums of money to construction projects mm -hmm. that I tell them, you know, yeah, boo. <laughs> yeah, boo, because <laughs> you are the way mm -hmm. Yeah, boo. Um, I can do a project because, you know, I know where to get all the materials mm -hmm. um, cost effective. Um, I, most of the works that contractors do in this country, like a six classroom block, the amount they do it, I can do it more than quarter of it. <laughs> I know where to get the stones, I know where to get the sand, good texture, you know, of soil. I know where to get it. In your, so most of our projects were done very, 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 very cheap. That's good. You know. And uh, that was, I mean, that is one of the things that I really thank God for my father. You know, um, he stood on his grounds. Even when I said, no medical doctor or an army officer, he said, uh, 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 you would do this. At least you earned money from it before school. So you go do it, you know, and you will be amazed um, what will come out. So when the workers come around, I have a team of workers we work. When they come around, they go like, we need to move my you know. I need to you know. Because I make them to understand. 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 I make them
Into me temple, I dare not worry, and I say, Oh, I'm going to school into me, you know. And so, when you come to the side, we keep correcting them, you know. Practices that without classroom or theoretical work, you wouldn't understand, yeah. you yeah. know. So, yeah. it is it has been extreme asset, extreme, wow. you know, because I don't get the services of. Um, even architects, you know, the architects I have, they rather would now, after they are putting the, the project into a work drawing, then they, they, they process it for the permits and everything. That is the part they do. But for them to come to site, to interpret what is on paper, you know, to the project, they don't do that, I you see. know, because I understand every detail of the drawing. Well, so I emphasize on that point because I'm on a campaign to try and get parents that don't be shy or look down on skills work because it pays. Oh, it really you pays. Know, so that's why I, you know. And it really pays. I mean, <laughs> the monies we give to these um, guys we work with um, cannot be compared to people sitting in the offices. Mm. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, if you bring me an estimate of a project, what takes chunk of the money even more than materials is labor. Mm. I mean, skill training is... Let's look at countries that are thriving like Japan, China, and places like that. These guys don't have white-collar guys who are, you know, I'm at this, this, that, uh, managing director of this, whatever, director. There's not too much of that. These guys are skilled people. They, they've got it here. Mm. You know, it's either technology or skills, mm. you know. And I will want to encourage, you know, the free SHS thing. You know, when we, we finish this thing... Instead of a lot of the people going to waste their time in university, because most of these guys come out from, from university and they don't even have jobs. I am not discouraging the university and you can see that's why we have technical universities. Mm -hmm. You can go there and polish yourself up. But if everybody is going to be um, management, administration, and uh, we have all many managers and administrators, what are you going to manage and administrate? I see this guy come here, tireless, electricians, plumbers, you know, steel benders, air conditioning technology. Yesterday I was telling you about my air condition technologist. Mm. This guy does air conditions. When he fix one air condition, a normal two horsepower, <coughs> he charges you 500 for installation. If he services 300 for installation. Now, can you just imagine if he fix 100 ACs wow. for a newly built offices? Just servicing those ones is 30,000. Just servicing. He comes in and does the services within a week, he's done. How many people take 30,000 for a week. a week? So we're encouraging the guys, you know, instead of going to do general arts, which puts all of us in a particular direction, and uh, at the end of the day, you do not have the jobs. Look at the, you know, the housing deficit that Ghana has right now. I mean, seriously, uh, construction will never stop. Mm -hmm. See, that's why commodities like um, cement and those guys are never going to run out of cash. They are going to be blessed all the time and all the time because they've got the money. Oh, I'm going to take another break and we're coming straight back to find out how the dream of Abasta began. Don't go away. Thank you very much for staying and I'm still here with Prophet Dr. Kofi Odro. Such an amazing story. I say we always see their glory but we don't know the story. And I'm so glad that he's opened out to us because I know he's reaching out to somebody out there who's going wayward and knows that look, it's not the end. I can turn my life around. Thank him so much. Also, uh, this is a wild card question. Did you meet, meet Mrs. Odro in the Shaka Zulu days? Or, <laughs> or, you, or you met him in the, in the Pastor Odro days? You know, when, I, when, I met her in, in the Pastor Odro days. Oh, thank when God. When <laughs> Reverend Dicham gave us an opportunity to start, you know, I used to go to the church to pray every day. Mm. Um, when I finished school and I had a friend to start a fellowship at Dancerman, I came back to Abeka. You know, because one of the things that they didn't want, I didn't want to come was, you know, now everybody saw you like an enemy because you had disowned the gang. <laughs> um, 
So when I come there, I do not want to stay home. So I will go to the church to pray morning till evening. So I go like 8 o'clock and then I finish off like 4 p.m. Wow. then come home. Reverend Ditcham used to stand on the altar and sometimes look at me. He will go and come. He said, what kind of prayers is it that somebody can pray from morning till evening without even taking a break? So one day he invited me and said, I've been observing you for some time now. I want you to come and uh, lead our prayers this Friday. I went, I mean, the power of God that he had, I don't think he had seen anything like wow. that. Even me, I had not seen anything like that. The move of God was just amazing. And so he invited me to lead the next all night I did. The, it was it was scary. I mean, when it was scary. I had never seen any outpouring like that. Even me, I was new into it. It was really intriguing and revealing. So he decided, you know, with his session that I am going to give this young man an, an opportunity to start a Friday morning prayer session. It is. It wasn't, you know, common. Now you see every Presbyterian church <coughs> having this services Friday. It wasn't like mm. that. It was, well, ours was the first of its kind. <clears throat> when we started, we started with 15 people. The next week it was 47 people. The next it was almost 120 people. Then, you know, Papa asked me if we could, you know, do a week revival. We did. And for that week I saw for the first time in my ministry over a thousand people Whoa. gathering. Little did I know that the Lord was starting to move. You know, it, my ministry is the prophetic ministry. Um, what it is right now is the end time prophetic, eschatological prophetic move. You know, it brings order and brings sanity, reminding you that whatever you are doing in this life, you are accountable to God. And then you need to be circumspect and do it, you know, as God will be the judge. And so um, the prophetic grace, I mean, some of the things that comes up really even amazes me. I mean, because God can tell story. I remember one um, in the revival, our first revival, I remember one of the nights. There's a man who was sitting on the gallery. In our meetings, and I'm not joking, in those days, um, if we said in Abeka Presby that we were having a revival, the service was going to start at 6 o'clock. And if you were not there by 3.30, there is no way you are going to sit in the building. Whoa. And our building, uh, you know, is quite a sizable, you know, could take almost like a thousand people. There was no way you could sit in the building. So we had canopies all around the church with short, short circuit cameras, mm -hmm. televisions all over around the church. And this was sustained in all the times that we were there. I mean... Our Presbyterian church became the biggest Presbyterian church in this country overnight. On Fridays, there was no space for even car parking and all stuff like that. It was a move of God, you know. Miracles, I mean, I cannot describe them. So Papa, you know, said, all right, Kofi, you lead this thing every Friday. How old are you by then? Um, in the 20s? 20s, because I got married at 22. Okay. Yeah. And so whilst we were starting, the, you know, my wife was one of the, you know, the people that joined the team okay. that wanted to train as pastors. You know, I had a, quite a number of like nine people who wanted to. They became prayer warriors and uh, they were training to be pastors. So that one day I just walked to her and I said, I, I want to... Uh, I have a proposal or a submission to make. She said, you are my pastor. I said, I know. I have a submission to make. I want to marry you. She, she was stumped. She was dumbfounded. You know, <laughs> till today she tells the story, I married my pastor. <laughs> I, I am privileged to marry my pastor. So it was during the Pastor Drew days, you know. Reverend Ditchen, wherever he is, I really thank God for his life. I mean, he gave me a lifetime opportunity. You know, which was pro pro really protest. The protest for that particular decision was unbelievable. Wow. We had serious opposition in the church. Yeah. I mean, people wrote letters to the presbytery. Then the you know that the miracle. No, no, I'm not joking. I remember this story. I was a one man was sitting on the gallery. The Lord gave me a prophetic word, and said. 
And we say, man, say they, now you come from this particular tribe, you are from this particular town, you da 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 da. Your mother's age is that, your age is that. Like, whispered to the, I could see him whispering to somebody, and said, like, it's me, but I'm shy to just come out. And the Lord went further. I heard this afternoon, you drove around the Dansoman area and you bought Kokone and Katie by the roadside. But you didn't eat the two people in the car, a man and a woman. The guy go like, wow, no. who is this? Then the guys went like, <laughs> And so, you know, I was one of the first people for people to call fake. You know, so today when we hear all that kind of, it means it's not news to me. So I said, oh, I quit so I drew. And someone walking can I'm not. Started writing letters all over. So when Reverend Paul Ditchum finished his stewardship at our Beckham Press, we were kicked out together. I mean, the moment he left, they kicked us out. Go like, one for one, seven, and three, I'm called. So Alabasta started like, you know, when we, we were kicked out, we started a, a fellowship, a Friday fellowship mm -hmm. that went for a few years. Uh, we didn't have a place. And then one day we came, um, we're looking, looking, looking. This land which this church is built on belonged to my grandfather and grandmother. That's why we call this place Damponsa Memorial Temple, because I named it after my grandmother and father who gave us this land, never collected a cent from us. God bless them. Never. God bless I them. I mean, we have been here free all this year still now. You know. Um, so my grandfather said, well, this place used to be a feeding shop. And so he said, if you can kick out the feeders, uh, the mechanics from the place, then the land. Probably harder than building the church. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't want the guys to know that it was me. So I hired a contractor and I said, you know what? Kick these guys out for me. So he collected the vehicles and placed it on, on the street. AMA came and said, yeah, you need to get out of this place. And then the amazing thing for us, you know, we were able to pitch a structure, just then, just a pavilion. We started amazing. The turnout was just amazing. We had our own trial of the, trial of the time when I traveled to England. Mm. You know, that was when I met. That's where, I, <laughs> that's where, I, that's where I passed across. <laughs> you know, um, traveled to England. I was in England for almost four years. And so when I came back, they had the people I left the church, they couldn't really keep it. Um, so it has, you know, diminished. And we had to start all over again. And uh, whilst I came, we had to relocate also to our main church, which is Asapiman. We built a lovely cathedral. God has been extremely benevolent to us. Um, gave us a space of land, almost about 32 plots of land. So we've been able to, you know, by the grace of God, put up something very wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so um, we had to move there and we diminished even further. The rude awakening and the encounter that turned everything started from there, you know, because I had a lot of time on my hands. I prayed, you know, if you don't have anywhere to go and all that. You know, I told people that God had reduced me from preaching on 10 television stations in England. You know, I have preached on Wonderful TV, OB TV, KICC TV, Wonderful TV, Believe TV. The list goes on up till 10. Uh, preached definitely on Rainbow Radio, that's where I met you, Nana, and so on and so forth. And then I come back to England, to a I come back to Ghana to a diminished work, and I don't even have one television or radio station that I will minister. I saw that, what is, you one time, my wife, the Lord bless her, I mean, she's been an encourager through the wilderness periods, uh, you know. And all those days, you know, most of my friends that I knew in ministry, we used to minister for and not everybody deserted us. When I came back from England, the first two years was very crazy. Wow. Very, very, very crazy. Our name just diminished out of the system. And little did I know that God was working on us. God wanted to reorientate and re 
reposition us and re-change the message, the focus. Because I had the rude awakening and encounter that I will never for one time I was I'm used to waking up without my wife. Mm. Now sometimes we live in you know two different places, so sometimes she's not with me. But then because we have a school and she manages the school, she will leave with the children who then were also students of the school, so they will leave. So one day, I woke up. When I woke up, she wasn't there. It's normal. The house where we lived then was a story building. I saw two men come from the walls into the room. So I became intrigued. I woke up, I sat up and go like, where did you come from? Because there's no access through there. And even if this is a story building, so this is upstairs. Where did you come from? And they go like, we are here to tell you or to teach you or to show you how death is like. I said, well, just, I just said in our language, you know, whether I will badge or not they pounced on one to my left one to the they picked me from the bed and then whilst we were going towards the wall i saw my body fell to the ground and i went like but i'm coming out of my body they said this is how death experience is and then we went through the wall to something like a lift and then instantly the lift shut I have never seen anything that is fast like that. I have driven fast cars, <laughs> so I understand speed. There was, I mean, there is a, the thing went up. <laughs> Suddenly, we were in a place, lights, sinking, angels. And it was like those escalators in the airport, not the ones that goes, you know, in ascension. The ones that are flat mm -hmm. on the ground, especially when your boarding gate is very mm -hmm. far, you, you know, just stand mm -hmm. on it and just takes you. But this one, it was very fast. Everything was very fast, you know, in the environment where we went. You know, the thing just started moving so fast, it just went very fast. Suddenly, we were before a sea. Then it dropped before me that I, the throne of God has a sea of glass. We were in front of a sea, and on the sea is the throne. On the throne, I could hear the voice while the escalator was going forward. And it was saying that COVID run and Masuma and Ampes were you know, that that was the voice that was coming to me. You know, why is it that I have assigned you and you don't want to do that which I have assigned you? Many, many people have disappointed me. They have digressed from the course of the truth and the integrity of the text of my word and have polluted the pure oil of anointing and power. Why do you want to follow them? I want to make you a distinction, why? And I wanted to, you know, respond and say, but you know, the, the, the man is not favorable and I wanted to say some things. And then instantly the escalator stopped and then I could hear the whole of the environment very quiet. Then he said, remember, there is no time. And then the thing started moving back. And the thing, the, that voice started echoing. Remember, there is no time, there is no time, there is no time, there is no time. The thing started coming back to the lift. And then the two angels were waiting there. It just brought me into the lift, they closed. It came back. When we got back, we entered. My body was still on the floor. These guys pushed me. I have never seen anything like that. And this body, when we say it's clay, Nana, it's really clay. The one that came out and the one that was lying on are two separable, you know, entities. They pushed me back into the body. I woke up. It was a revelation, a vision, a dream, whatever you want to call it. When I opened my eyes, my wife was sitting on the bed. I was sweating, perspiring. Their condition was still on, 15 degrees, sweating. My wife told me that within about an hour, 
Since we got married, he has never seen anything like me. Like I was fighting. And he didn't want to touch me. And then I said, Me when you knew, he laughed. I said, Me, don't laugh. It's a serious business. Me when you knew. She laughed. Then I narrated the ordeal. At the time, we had just gone to Sapim and there was no building on the land. And the things that kept ringing. Remember, there is no time. There is no time. There is no time. So we had some little revenue in the accounts. I said to my wife, let's go today. I don't, I don't want to digress. Let's go to the bank. Let's get the money. Let's build the city God wants us to build and do whatever he wants us to do for him. You then be free. I feel like you know, this thing is too much. Also, unfortunately, I've run out of time. But there may be somebody listening who wants to come and experience Alabaster. What do they do? We are here at Tessano every Sunday, two services. The W3, we call it uh, Word Worship Wonders. The F5, Fresh Fire for Family and Friends. That starts also at 9 o'clock to 11. Everything you are seeing now is as a result of that encounter. Our message changed, our life changed, our everything changed. The same message that we started preaching in the quarters of Sapim and the ghettos of it that nobody will even take note. Uh, the same messages now that people are We so can't get crazy. enough of <laughs> Folks, unfortunately, time is not on our side. But remember, there's no time. It applies to all of us. <laughs> Until next week that I come to you with another fantastic guest, this has been one interview that, you know, I'm going to walk away with a lot. So thank you very much for watching. And, uh, hey, I'll be with you next week. Also, thank you so much. And I'm so grateful. God bless you. Thank you for that.